going to hear from him, and we'll, we'll hear all those great presentations. You guys can ask questions. We can go back and forth. He's in San Diego as we speak. Um, and, uh, and so this is, a, uh, and amongst other things, he's the uh, head guru of um, a really interesting organization that seeks to foster a deeper, better, more, more innovative um, businesses and economies centered around the coastal zone and the ocean. And so he's, he's a really nice guy. Um, it's been great to work with him over the last couple of years. Last year, for the first time, I brought you guys as a class to uh, a meeting that they have in a couple of weeks. And it's a great meeting. I'd love for you guys to go. But we obviously are, are stretched thin going to the island symposium, the Hawaii trip, all that kind of stuff. So we couldn't, couldn't afford to do it or actually work it in the budget and the, in the uh, schedule for you guys, at least this year. Um, but it's something we're hoping to continue on and also um, a great resource. So he'll tell us more about that, but um, in addition to other stuff, um, Michael's been advocating for um, a wider role and an, an improved perception of our coastal and marine economy, what he calls the blue economy, um, wider in our society, both in terms of political structures, in terms of educational institutions, this and that. So he's, he's got a, a huge role to play, and he's been playing a huge role. He's based in San Diego. And, and they're, they're, they're centered in San Diego, but really they're interested in, in the whole um, blue economy broadly writ in San Francisco, in, in, in Santa Barbara, in LA, all that kind of area. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you guys to Michael Jones. And Mike, uh, if, it's, if the speakers here are a little bit loud, I'll adjust them as we talk. So if you guys, if it's a little too loud or not, or not loud enough, let me know and we'll adjust. Cool. And we have, we have a, so we can see you guys. We have, we have the wide angle on, um, but he can't see 100% everybody. So if you guys do have a question, um, which, is, which is great, maybe you guys could come to the, the front of the camera if you guys are one of the folks off the side, just so we can see that you guys, you know, raising your hand or asking a question. Um, sound good? All right. Ready, set, go. Michael, I think they can, I think they can hear you. Excellent. Um, so first of all, thank you, Sean, for inviting me. Can you see him as well? Yes, okay. Oh, well, I, I, I can make you see him. There you go. Now they can see you. <laughs> so it's uh, great. I wish I could be there physically, but um, I've got too many meetings going on. So um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. And Sean, thank you for the nice introduction. What I thought I would do is I put an agenda together, um, but I sent it relatively late to, uh, to Sean, so I'm going to walk down this. And I broke it up into kind of six different parts. One is to talk about the blue economy, how big is it, how is it growing, so you guys can kind of figure out where, where your future is in the blue economy. I'll talk a little about some of the studies that we've done, and then I'll talk about the Maritime Alliance. So the studies are things that we've done primarily for San Diego, but they have a implications for the country as well. Uh, so I'll talk about the Maritime Alliance, some of the things that we've gotten published. Um, then I thought I'd go through a couple of presentations that I've given to different audiences so you can see um, how we present what we are doing and what the blue economy is doing, and talk about some of the companies, because I think you'll be surprised at the breadth of the companies that uh, we're dealing with. I'll talk a little bit then about national and international outreach. Uh, we're working across the United States and around the world. Then I'll end by talking about some of our coming events. And, um, and I'm happy to take questions along the way. If it seems like it's a question that I'll be answering later, if you'll, uh, you'll let me do so, I'll just mention that. But uh, it doesn't bother me to stop along the way. Um, but I will try and, and move through this relatively quickly so we have a, hopefully a, a, a good question and answer period again. So one of the things that I sent to, to Sean is a, which hopefully he will share with you because I'm sure he didn't have a chance to do Absolutely. it Absolutely. Yeah, I'll share all this up with you guys. Is a uh, study that was done by the OECD. And the OECD is the, uh, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's got 34 countries. Virtually every democracy belongs to it. It's uh, in Paris. Nice place to live. But it is kind of the think tank for democracy. And they're known for doing a lot of economic work. And it's what's really surprising is that they just published their first ever study on the value of the ocean. 
Now, you guys are all sitting there. You're not far from the ocean. I'm not far from the ocean. You probably know that 71% of the world's surface is water, and 98% of habitable Earth is underwater. Um, over 90% of all of our goods go by move by water. I'm told that over 90% of all uh, telephone traffic uh, is going underwater. So one way or the other, um, the oceans are incredibly important for us for many, many reasons, ecological reasons, historical reasons, social reasons, economic reasons. But the world has really not studied the blue economy. And so what you've had is, for some, to some extent, is you've got conservationists who have been trying to save the ocean, and that's a, obviously a laudatory goal, and I've been a, I grew up as a conservationist, so it's dear and dear to my heart. But it's a little hard when all when you're really saying doom and gloom and the world, you know, we gotta do this, we're all gonna die. It's a lot better if you get people working together and saying, you know, we need to do this because it's, it's, it's a golden goose. The ocean is an enormous resource for us. We've been using it uh, for forever since uh, recorded time, but it's essentially as if people have neglected it. So to put this in perspective, the worldwide water market, so fresh water. And, and, and wastewater is about $500 billion a year. That's a big number. Uh, everybody knows we have a water problem in California in the Southwest, big numbers. What people didn't realize was that number is dwarfed by the blue economy. So one of the things I sent to Sean is a uh, just the executive summary from a report that's called The Ocean Economy in 2030 that was published this year by the OECD, the organization I talked about a few minutes ago. They estimate the annual value of the ocean, the extractive nature of what we're doing, whether it's fishing or oil and gas, many different areas, um, represents $1.5 trillion a year. So it's over three times, times the size of the water industry. And yet nobody's ever studied it, which is absolutely stunning. Now, when you, when you say something like this to elected officials, I think all of us want to take care of the ocean. Nobody walks in and says, I'm going to go drain the ocean today. Um, but when you, when you show people that the economic value is, is incredibly important alongside the uh, conservation nature of it, and the fact that every second breath comes from the ocean, and all the things we know about the, 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 the kind of the, the, the you know, reason we should be taking care of the ocean for our own uh, health of the world, but there also is a huge economic driver that people have not really understood. So this, this, this report is a first ever effort by the OECD to look at the value. And not only did they say that this number was $1.5 trillion a year, in what they said by, by, that was by 2010, and they kept saying in this report very conservatively that it was $1.5 trillion. Um, and they claim that's about 2.5% of the world gross value added. They say by 2030, that will be $3 trillion. Now that's enormous, $3 trillion. That's a lot of money. <laughs> the whole US economy is about $17 trillion. So we're talking about one of the largest economies in the world and they keep saying very conservatively because this is their first study and they recognize there were a number of things that they didn't have the ability because we don't capture the data. U.S. government, European Union, Europe, United Nations do not capture the size of the blue economy. The next piece of the next thing I sent to Sean, um, we were chosen about two years ago, two and a half years ago, to do the first ever study for NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Decades ago, they studied the value of weather. We all want to know if a hurricane is coming. We want to know if bad weather is coming. We want to know if too much rain is coming. Because all those have implications for crops, for our homes, for our lives. Uh, but nobody's ever studied the value of what they call the ocean enterprise. Now, isn't that amazing? Here's NOAA, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They studied the atmospheric side, but they've never studied the ocean side. So we were chosen to be the co-author of the first ever study for the value of ocean observation. Now, this is a subset of a much larger blue economy. And what we came, what we found in this study was that there were 410 US companies in 36 states. It wasn't just on the coast, representing seven 
excuse me, seven billion dollars of direct revenue. And if you go into economics, people talk about direct economic benefit and then indirect and induced. So indirect means what do people, what do the direct people buy stuff from? Uh, what services are provided to that company that, that create a knock-on effect, which is positive, and then the induced is we all go out to the theater, we go to restaurants. So to have the direct impact and then to figure out what the indirect and the induced is, is extraordinarily important. That hasn't been done in the ocean economy. So we actually did a study, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, to look at that. But this is a whole industry that is essentially hasn't been studied. So. While you guys are looking at the work that you do and you're working with Sean, looking uh, at doing the important work related to conservation and the oceans and, and doing things the right way, you should also be thinking about the economic value because if we could show people, again, I'll use the example of the Golden Goose. Who wants to kill the Golden Goose? If we show people the value <laughs> of the oceans, they'll be much more inclined to work together and say, boy, this is really important. So now you get not just Democrats saying, yes, we'll save the ocean, we'll save the world. You have Republicans that say, we've got jobs here as well. And so we bring together in everything we do, three constituencies, education and academia. The second is policymakers, which is elected officials, it's economic development folks, uh, NGOs, truly really anybody that impacts the policy. And the third area is, is industry. And I'm not saying one is more important than the other. We don't have industry, we don't have jobs, we can't pay the bureaucrats. So they're all really <laughs> important to make sure that we're doing the right, doing things the right way. And unfortunately, industry has been left out of many of these discussions. Things like green spatial planning. Most industries feel very comfortable with it because in the state of California, for example, um, the planning that was done, the, the, the tens of millions of dollars that were spent to look at the, at the uh, uh, the territorial waters was used to create green protected areas, but nothing was really given back to industry. So industry is not very uh, uh, pleased. And around the United States, industry often fights the green spatial planning because they haven't been, have been a good part of the process. And so we really need to get conservationists, elected officials, industry to come together, and they all have to feel that there's that there's a compromise position where they all can work together. So that's a little bit about the blue economy. Uh, the OECD spent the first ever $1.5 trillion in 2010 going to $3 trillion. The NOAA study, the first ever study, saying $7 billion in just one small, seg small segment of the blue economy. But that blew the socks off of the Secretary uh, of, the, of the Department of Commerce because they'd never done that study before. So the oceans are extraordinarily important, and we're just beginning to understand how important some of our studies, this is my second little topic area, um, we did a 2012 economic study, and you can find it online. Um, so it's basically the San Diego Maritime uh, Industry uh, 2012 report. And what we found was there were 46,000 jobs, these were direct jobs again, I mentioned the difference between direct jobs induced and, and uh, uh, direct, indirect, and induced. These were just direct jobs in San Diego County. 46,000 jobs, $14 billion in revenue. So to put that in perspective, uh, NOAA, using US government uh, statistics, says that the US economy, sorry, the San Diego uh, blue economy, have, when they take out um, uh, maritime recreation, which we don't include in our numbers, was only 1.8 billion dollars. Now we say 14 billion, they say 1.8. That's a factor of over six. And so now you get into this really interesting situation that we don't know how big something is. It's like taking a, it's like taking a trip. If you don't have a map, you can go on a trip, you don't know where you're going. And what's happened is we really don't know how big the ocean economy is. And so we're making decisions about the ocean without having good information. So our study was the first of its kind in the United States. Then subsequently Mississippi did a study, and right now we think um, Massachusetts is putting money together to do a similar kind of study. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We also have been working with the European Union, looking at their studies and others. So that was a 2012 study we did, um, which NOAA um, is now looking at uh, our study and trying to figure out how to create a new satellite account um, 
within the U.S. government, what we call the next codes, North American Industrial Classification System, that <laughs> was set up 20 years ago when NAFTA was created. And we are arguing, we the Maritime Alliance are arguing, that we need to have other criteria and we need to gather the information that is just lumped together. So robotics just put under instrumentation. There's no way to know how much money is being spent on maritime robotics, and that's not appropriate. So this economic study, you've got to first do something like that before you can make the case. And, and we are working with the Department of Commerce and other agencies to try and change the next code so that in the future we'll have a better way of gathering information. In 2014, we did two other reports. We did a marine spatial planning report um, that was done by University of California, San Diego. I became, Sean will be will cringe at this, but I became the principal investigator. <laughs> A group of, of uh, graduate students uh, at uh, the uh, what was then called the International Relations and Civic Studies School we had about six uh, uh, students that went out, did about 27 interviews uh, with everything from NGOs to industry, and came back and found that if we were to put forward a marine spatial planning process for our region, just our San Diego County, that we could add billions of dollars of economic value. To, the, to our region. And that's good paying jobs. One of the things we tell politicians is that every blue job is a good job. And that's really important because um, whether you're talking about historical jobs like stevedores and tugboat operators, they're making some of them really good money. Uh, one of our members is uh, one of the biggest tugboat companies in San Diego. They start people at 17 bucks an hour and they've got people making over $100,000 a year and working six months a year. And they'll go off and, and work on a tugboat in Guam or somewhere and come back and they're buying houses and they have great, great lifestyle. So you got, you got the traditional blue economy, which pays good money, and then you got blue tech, which is robotics and sensors of all kinds and, and specialized buoys and underwater communications. And I was the chief financial officer and the second largest shareholder in the world's fastest growing manufacturer of mini ROVs, and ROV operated vehicles, which you guys will probably know as a tethered robot. So um, we were paying people really well, um, far above minimum wage. So when you look across the blue economy, whether it's the traditional blue economy or it's the blue tech that we really focus on, they're good paying jobs. So um, we did a, also a supply chain study with two companies here, and we found that the induced and indirect jobs were higher with the blue economy or with blue tech than any other industry. So now what's, what we've realized in San Diego is that, that not only is blue tech important, it turns out when you talk about economic uh, development, we talk about traded economies. And in San Diego County, we have what we call three traded economies. One is tourism, which is our largest economy. The second is defense, which is our second largest economy. And the third is the innovation economy. And innovation is biotech and telecom and clean tech and beer tech and you know sports uh, tech and blue tech. And when that study was done, for the first time, politicians realized that the largest innovation economy, the largest innovation economy in San Diego County is the blue economy. And until our study in 2012, although we are a city built around a port and built around the Navy, nobody's ever studied the size of the blue economy. That's pretty mind-boggling. So 2012, we did the first study. People nationally began to recognize it, locally began to recognize it. We did 2014 a marine spatial planning study. Now we're talking about getting funding to do a marine spatial plan on San Diego County. And then we also did a supply chain study, which showed that, that the blue tech is a very rich supply chain when you get into indirect and induced jobs as well. So I'm going to stop for at, at a moment and answer any questions before I launch off into the maritime audience. Organization. Are there any questions anybody has talking about the blue economy or some of our study? Great numbers for quizzes and things. So if you guys want to double check any of your facts. When you're talking about the 
you're talking about the traditional uh, blue jobs, like you said, made an example of the tugboat. How much like educational experience is at the foundation of getting one of those jobs? You know, it's, it's a really good question. It depends on the job we're talking about. Uh, let me just pick, you know, three. Um, if you're a stevedore, the union is what really is driving it. It's not your education level. Um, if you're a, a crane operator, it's your your dexterity, your ability to pick things up and move things. You know, it can't be dumb. You've got to be able to read, but but it, it, it's not. It's not college education. Um, tugboat, you know, operators. Uh, again, they're certainly high school educated, maybe community college. And as I said to you, we we, we took a group this summer of of elected officials uh, uh, to visit with our tugboat company, and tugboat captain was there. And in the first day, all the people were talking about it. Um, and most of them are high school at best. Uh, community college educated and they're making um, certainly the kind of people that are given the responsibility to take a multi-million dollar tug out to Guam to do work or that same company is helping SpaceX and you probably know SpaceX is a private uh, space uh, transportation company when you're trying to have a, um, a first stage land on a platform and you've got a tug, a multi-million dollar tug was trying to land a multi-million dollar uh, uh, part of the capsule, uh, you want to make sure it's done right. So there's a lot of responsibility, but not necessarily a huge amount of education. Uh, so when you, when you look at these jobs, it, it really is all over the lot. Um, from high school education uh, to obviously green biologists, but most of our companies are looking for trained technical company, uh, staff, and they're looking for engineers. They aren't necessarily looking for PhDs uh, in marine biology. It's not to say it's not a worthy um, uh, area of study, but um, I can tell you that my companies that have lots of needs and they're struggling. I'll give you another example: is a is a uh, uh, people are coming out of the U.S. Navy, and I've got four of the top six companies in the world doing acoustic Doppler profilers, and. Who knows better than a sonar attack? And often these are high school educated, maybe they got some technical training, hopefully they got technical training in the Navy. <laughs> the ability to be a to be a sonar attack, I mean, it's essentially you're you're hearing just like you guys probably know you're using sonar to hear the whales, all the you know, all the things in the ocean that we're trying to measure. Well, they're trying to measure submarines and, and things like that. And if you don't have somebody that's, that's smart, able to find the other the opponent submarine, you may not be there very long, you know, the day after tomorrow. So these are very bright people that may not have uh, um, secondary uh, educational degrees that are making good money. So on the blue economy side, there are lots of jobs that, uh, that I'm not suggesting that having an education isn't important because I think it is. But it's one of the things about this industry that's different. When you look at when you look at biotech, you look at telecom, if you look at clean tech, they are primarily white collar industries. There aren't a lot of blue collar employees. If you look across the blue economy, I was the CFO, as I said to you, of the world's fast growing manufacturer of ROVs. We had engineers who were highly trained, we had sales staff that was modestly trained and had to be good with the gift of gab and knew how to sell stuff. And then we had we had a lot of technical people that were assembling and testing. And those people were making really good money. Um, and most of them were not college educated. So across the blue economy, you have blue and white collar jobs, which makes it pretty unusual. Because in San Diego, like many places, you have a barbell effect where you have highly educated, and then you've got the tourism jobs, and down the middle, you've got the skinny little bar. And the blue economy is one of those places that it really makes a dent and, and expands that skinny little bar. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's awesome, thank you. Yeah, now, and now I would just add to that right sizing, right? So right sizing, sizing your education for the, the kind of job you're looking for. And just like, like Michael was saying, you know, 
sometimes if you have a PhD or a master's degree, sometimes that makes you less um, less desirable for certain positions. You know, generally better to have more education, but this is a sector where um, I think you guys could do very well and other folks can do very well and our recent graduates have done very well because of the, those needs. Uh, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Sean, Sean hit it right in the head. I'll give you another example. One of our member companies is a company called Trading Resources Limited. And they train merchant mariners. Um, they're, they're a for-profit organization. They're one of the largest five in the United States. They have some pretty crappy facilities with some really good equipment inside it, and they're about ready to move to a state-of-the-art new facility. They've given over 8,000 programs. Um, now, many of those are, are not gone where, where you're Coast Guard approved and you gotta go back for, for uh, uh, ongoing education, continuing education. But they have trained, um, they have trained people from South San Diego, from, Bayou, from uh, Imperial Beach, which is one of the tourist uh, Areas we have, four cities we have, and and they're going off after after training and getting um, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and they have a hundred percent placement rate, hundred percent placement rate, because there are so many jobs open among merchant mariners. I personally don't want to be a merchant mariner because it means going out for long periods of time, but I can tell you that Cal Maritime. Which, which one of the CSU campuses and about 1,200 students has 100% placement. And their people go into both uh, the maritime academy, sorry, they go off and, and, and sail, but they also, because they're so well trained, they'll go in to work on buildings, you know, the boilers and things in buildings. Um, we have another one of our members is National University. They have a polytechnic. They teach people to be um, technical divers and they teach hyperbaric chamber uh, skills and things like that. They have a hundred percent placement. So these are specialized industry niches where we get really great jobs. It's just that we swung probably too far in one direction, which was, you know, getting a college education, getting a graduate degree was the only way to get a job. And I'm here to tell you that's not the only way to get a job. That's not to say it's not extraordinarily valuable. Because it's true that people with higher education typically will get a better paid job, but there are jobs all across the spectrum in the blue economy, and we don't see those going away. All right, so if that's okay, I'm going to move on then. So we have two nonprofits, um, and I, again, this is something I sent to Sean. We have a two page flyer if you want to know more about us. Uh, one page is uh, we're 501c3, which is an educational nonprofit, and we started something called Ocean STEM. We wanted to get old people interested, young kids interested in the oceans. Uh, nothing we think gets kids more interested than than the new ocean. We had some posters done for us pro bono by the guys who branded Starbucks and Disney stores. Pretty cool guys, and they did some amazing posters. And so we gave away last year, hopefully Sean. Yeah, I have some. we have some in the lab, yeah. In the other yeah, lab, in the other lab. Those posters. Yep, they're awesome. And, uh, one of the problems is there is no place today, and it's one thing we hope to get some money to work on, there is no place today to send young people to know all the jobs on the exist in the ocean. It's harder to imagine, but there is no place that has yet been developed to show the jobs across the ocean. So we want to work with universities to help us do interviews of, of, of professionals, and we have, we, we have on our roadmap to really uh, work on that. But from the, the three things that our 501c3, our, our educational nonprofit, do is we focus on, on uh, uh, education, um, and then this thing called Ocean STEM, so workforce development. The second area is research. I talked about three studies we've done. And the third area is community outreach. So we helped start the first fisherman direct to public market in California. It turns out that you know, we know about, um, about farmers markets, but there, is no, there has been no legal way to have a fisherman's market. It's been a gray area. And so we were able to convince 
uh, working with Port of San Diego and the, the, the county supervisors, we created a uh, dockside market. Now there are other dockside markets, but to bring it onto the dock, start filleting, selling not the whole fish, but parts of fish, has been a gray area that nobody knew anything, nobody had ever done it before. And even Pike Smart, which many people have been to, to Seattle and they say, oh, they've been to Seattle. It's not true. That's actually part of a restaurant. And so that fishing is that whole fishing play and throwing the fish around, all that show that they do, that's all part essentially of a restaurant. Uh, that's how they got that approved. So the state of California, one of probably one of the few things that's ever been unanimously approved, the assembly, <laughs> the Senate, passed the law essentially establishing fresh fish markets in the state of California. And that started with us. So those are the three things that our 501c3 does. Then we have a 501c6, which is an industry association. And the industry association also does three things. It creates, it promotes economic development. It works on the, what we call business ecosystem development. So we're trying to get people educated, aware of what's going on in this economy. And the third area is national and international outreach, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so those are the two nonprofits that we have. We have boards of directors. We're actually in the process of making some changes. But if you memorize the, the, the two pages that I sent to Sean, you'll know everything about us, and you can be one of our ambassadors. <laughs> the, I wrote an op-ed piece, which I also sent to Sean. It's called uh, Maritime Vision for California. Um, I would suggest that that he print that and share it with you. I got I got it up on the screen right here, but I will do that. Okay, so if you have it up on the screen, a maritime vision for California. So this was an op-ed piece, but you know, as it goes down, it talks a little bit about the blue economy. If you go down to the, the second paragraph, the San Diego and the state of California are powerhouses of ocean and water technology research and industry, yet it goes unnoticed. If you go down a little bit further. It says, Californians have a choice. We can either import the world's problems or develop an export solution. And that's why it's so critically important that all of you understand the blue economy. Conservation is critically important, but so is smart economic development. And so what we have to be doing is promoting conservation, recycling, and smart economic growth. Those are the three parts to this. And the, the, the indictment that I have of our educational system, and I'm talking primarily about research organizations in places like Scripps that have incredible research, is that they have not taken the next step. They have not been good at tech transfer, and they have not been good at all in really showing the world how we should create, how we should, we should create the, the industries of tomorrow. And so the United States is falling behind in many ways around the rest of the world because we do the research but we're not creating the industry. So our mantra, our mission statement is we promote sustainable science-based ocean and water industry. That's that's our mission. The Maritime Alliance promotes sustainable, thereby conservation, science-based, it's got to be science-based, ocean and water industry. And we believe that having the two together, ocean and water, is really important. Water comes from the sky, and it either gets absorbed into the land or goes right back into the ocean, run off to run off, and then it, then it uh, uh, goes right back up because it, 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 it uh, and becomes clouds and, and then rains on us again. I mean, the, the whole cycle is the cycle of life, and yet we humans have often looked at water and the oceans differently, and yet the ocean really is part of that cycle of life. If you go a little bit further, the next paragraph, some believe that space is the final frontier, that there is much more to discover in the oceans that are more immediately addressed pressing earth problems like climate change, hunger, the need for potable water and new medicine. Yet NASA's fiscal 2013 budget is $17.8 billion versus $5 billion for NOAA. NASA's exploration budget was roughly $3.8 billion while well, NOAA's Office of Exploration Research received $23.7 million. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we have not given economic value to the ocean. And we really don't see it. It's out of sight, out of mind. You walk out to the ocean and you look across, unless there's big waves, you just see this 
placid, lovely spot. Can't see what's underwater unless it reaches. Whereas you look up and you see the heavens. In the early 60s, the amount of money that was given to NOAA and NASA was about the same. Today, it's almost it's over three times the budget at NASA than in NOAA. And if you look at the amount of, of, of exploration, 3.8 billion versus all around number, $24 million. That's, it's incredible. Now, I don't begrudge space anything. Um, I think we've gotten a certain number of things out of space, but it's going to be hundreds and hundreds of years before the big problems on Earth are going to be solved by finding fungus on Europa. Um, and we're actually, we were chosen to start help start a new conference called Space Town in Houston. We are the subject matter to, to look at the at the intersection of the space economy and the blue economy. And I actually have a presentation that I'll show to you in a little while. But it's not fair, it's completely inappropriate, and frankly very short-sighted that we are not putting more exploration dollars and development dollars into the ocean. And it's partially because nobody understands the economic value. And the fact that NOAA just did the first ever study on the economic value of ocean observation in 2016, we were co-authors is telling how little we really have understood. That's why I started by trying to explain to you the value of the blue economy. OECD says 1.5 trillion, that's a worldwide estimate, whereas the no estimate was just a subsegment of the US blue cash. Because we're now beginning to understand the incredible value of the ocean. So as you go through this, what you're doing with Sean um, is it's important to understand the scientific side, but think broader, think about the economic side of this. Well, I'm not going to go through further, uh, but this is an argument for why it is important to understand the, the value and why we should have a maritime vision for the whole state of California. And while we are based in San Diego, we really do feel that we have a national, regional and national mandate. The next thing I gave to Sean is a, um, uh, an announcement uh, if he pulls it up, it should say something like Falconer Cox launch Blue Tech Vision for San Diego. Got it up. Got it up right now. Okay. So the reason this is important is it took us years to convince elected officials that the economy, the blue economy, is important. It started, you know, with us waving our arms back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 2012, the study that was done. Now we've got people that the state controller, Betty D, will be with us in about four weeks. She has decided she's one of the constitutional elect officials in the state of California. She and the Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom, sit on the California State Lands Commission. Now, now think about this. California State Lands Commission is responsible for all the waters of the state of California. It doesn't say State Lands and Water Commission. It's the State Lands Commission. So every bay and the territorial waters, the three miles territorial waters, and then from three to 200 miles is the exclusive economic zone. That's federal. But the, the, the out of Sacramento, the territorial waters and the bays are essentially managed, they're owned by all of us as citizens of the state, but they're managed by State Lands Commission. They have a small staff. They have no idea what we want to do in San Diego. And so right now, for the first time in the state of California, State Lands Commission is negotiating with the Port of San Diego to take over responsibility. Because heretofore, no port has had any interest, any economic interest in the ocean, as a result of which they've been willing to do nothing related to the ocean. All they care about is ingress, egress, so logistics. Stuff comes in, containers, cars come in, nice, pasta. Nobody cares whether they recreate the ocean or have boats or skin dive, because all they were were land-based logistic hubs. The Port of San Diego, because this is coming, has now hired an aquaculture specialist and a blue tech specialist, because they're now looking at the ocean as, as, as a way to make money. So back to this economic incentive, I want people to have an economic incentive. Because until you have an economic incentive, if somebody says, would you go spend time for me, you know, go stand in the line for me. And you say, well, why would I do that? Well, I'll pay you. Okay, I'll do it then. Maybe you'll do it because you're friends. But world makes, you know, I assume that you're paying something to go to college. 
Well, you know, you take something when you work. And so we want we want industry and, and, and actors like the Port of San Diego and ports across the state and ports around the country to have an economic reason to think about the value of the ocean. And so we are impacting, we have impacted California State Lands Commission. And on the board of the California State Lands Commission is Betty E, who is the controller, who is going to be one of our speakers in November. And also um, the Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom, who is, I would, some would say, the odds on favorite to become the new governor after Jerry Brown. He, if you were to go onto our, website, onto our YouTube site, we have a blue text YouTube site, and there's a 20 minute video of my executive director, Greg Murphy, talking to State Lands Commission this past December, eight months ago, nine months, ten months ago. As a result of that, State Lands Commission put a blue economy paragraph and goal into their new five-year plan. If we hadn't done all the things that we've done up to this point, they would realize that blue economy matters. And they wouldn't be saying that for them, they need to be thinking about the blue economy. So now you have the, them saying the blue economy is important. And Betty E has agreed to, to sit on the panel with the officials that will, she'll be with us on November uh, 9th, which is the day after Election Day. And then that evening, she's going to be a featured speaker. Now, she doesn't know a hell of a lot about the ocean, but she's going to talk about how important the blue economy is. So we have to educate at every level, San Diego, state level, federal level, and internationally about the value of the blue economy and the work that you guys are going to go off and do. And that's why I think it's very important that I show you this, because this was in 2015. This is Kevin Faulkner is the mayor of San Diego. Supervisor Greg Cox is one of our five county supervisors. And they together launched the Blue Tech Vision for San Diego. Now, the first United States, the first we know in the world. But that's not the point. The point is that we're trying to be a a model for other people, that other people need to understand the value of the blue economy and blue tech. And anywhere you guys go and work, anywhere, you should be thinking about the value of the blue economy and blue tech. This happens to be the announcement by these people, and it re regurgitates some of the, the 2012 material, but it also calls for the establishment of a blue tech incubator. And we are in the process of trying to create one. Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada is creating one. Toulon, France is creating a blue tech incubator. And Cork, Ireland has created the first that we know in the world. And we will be linking all of those. So when we have companies in our blue tech incubator, they won't be by themselves. Not only will they have the San Diego's Petri dish uh, and the relations we have with the Navy and University, the CSU system, the UC system, with people like Betty E at the state level, but they'll also have access to other incubators in other countries. So you begin to see how these a mosaic is being uh, is being developed, or a, a a fabric is being woven that is that is local, it's state, it's federal, and it's international. We have a Blue Tech YouTube channel. If you just write that down, Blue Tech YouTube uh, channel. You can go there, we've got probably about a dozen uh, different videos. They range from two minutes to 20 minutes. Uh, actually, we have one that I think is an hour and a half or two hours, but that was something I put on at, at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., where we were talking about the blue economy and, and policy. Um, one of the things that's on there, and several of your former classmates, we, there's a video of um, our Blue Economy Workforce of Tomorrow Day. And Sean was there with a class. And you may recognize some of the people that are were videotaped. This was last um, year. This is last year's class. Last year's class. OK. Well, uh, and what you'll see is them saying, I had no idea. I mean, I had no <laughs> idea what the economy was. I had no idea that there were these kinds of companies. Because what we do is we run that as day two uh, track two of day two of our summit. So we have exhibitors, we have 
right? So we have HR people there from companies, and we have and we have executives that are speakers that come and, and you hang out over drinks together. I mean, when I say drinks, I'm going to poke a pole during the day and then drinks at night. Age appropriate. Uh, age appropriate. <laughs> but I mean, Sean was nice enough to, to uh, uh, provide a testimonial. Uh, and we're just in the process now of beginning to advertise for that. Last year, we had 65 people at that, at that day, including uh, this group of six or seven that Sean brought down. This year, we expect over 100. And we'll actually talk about that a little bit later. And, and I would just think, even though we can't, I don't have any money to send you guys. Um, I would really encourage you guys. Again, it's the first week, or I guess the second week of um, November. And if you guys want to go to that, that'd be great. And we could work out you guys missing some class and stuff. It, it really is a, a great. I know you guys just attended. Many of you just attended the Island Symposium. And I think you guys, right, generally found that to be a great experience, right? This is this is um, even more so directed in terms of career pathways for you guys and giving you guys additional ideas and stuff. So. So I would encourage you guys to consider um, consider that, and I'll share with you all the information after the fact. So the last thing I'll mention about, about us, the Maritime Alliance, is um, the Department of Commerce, which is the U.S. government agency responsible for promoting U.S. Um, um, economic growth, um, has within it a group called the International Trade Administration, the ITA. And we applied for and received the first ever um, maritime Technology Export Program for the United States. And it's not a huge amount of money given the size of the United States, $297,000. But the fact that the Department of Commerce, for the first time ever, is focusing on the, focusing on the blue economy and blue tech has extraordinary significance. Now, we're really excited, and we have a whole program of how we're going to use that money to promote companies and bring buyers um, to the United States. So um, we'll, we'll make that money last as long as possible. We are taking zero out of it. Normally you take 10 or 15 percent out of the overhead. Um, we're not taking a penny out of it. 100 percent of that money will go essentially to the benefit of companies. But again, the reason I'm telling you these things is that we're at the starting gates in many ways for the blue economy and blue tax. The ability to work deep in the ocean is so much greater today than it was even five years ago. We are moving so rapidly in terms of new technology that whole new industries will be created in the ocean that didn't exist. Let me just give you one really big example. We all know sea level rise is, 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 is coming. We don't know how big, we don't know how fast, but we know it's here and it's, and it's getting worse. You think about all the assets that are right on the coast, not just people, but ports, airports, desalination plants, and power plants are ones that come to mind. Now, why are they there? Power plants, because you use water as a heat sink, you dissipate heat. Desalination plants, because you need the salt water as a feedstock. Airports, partially because it's, you're not going over people as much if you use the ocean. Um, God forbid there's a crash, but it's, it's a lot better to have it on flat area near, near an airport, near, near the coast. Um, and ports because you got to get in and out. So what are we going to do as water starts rising? How far are you going to move the port? How far are you going to move a billion dollar desal plant? Well, you're not. You can't. You won't know how far to move it inland. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a huge amount of development 20 years from now, 40 years from now, but certainly within your lifetime, on floating infrastructure. And that will have all kinds of ramifications um, in terms of anchoring things and moving things, logistics. And there's just so much, so many implications of floating infrastructure. And we're just at the start of it. We've been working for about seven years at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. Uh, on their concept of a huge new floating port. The only two ports that are being conceived on the west coast of North America, one is in Canada, in Prince Rupert, and the other one is in Pensacola Net in Mexico. Because between NIMBYism and no, new, no natural harbors left to exploit, there are no harbors really on the west coast of the United States. 
And what's happening is quite the opposite. You have mega trends like bigger and bigger ships, which means a smaller and smaller number of, of ports are going to be able to accommodate them, which means we create a higher and higher economic risk, homeland security risk, uh, bottleneck risk, um, than if we have hundreds of ports. The United States actually has about 250 meaningful commercial ports, but this is gonna, it's gonna probably end up having about 10 ports, 10 ports that are gonna be big enough to take these massive new ships. So there's something called the Marine Highway, which Mahari and Maritime Administration has been pushing. And the way to get to the Marine Highway is to have offshore floating ports 20 miles offshore. God forbid there's a nuclear dirty bomb. It costs us $15 billion, X number of lives, but it wouldn't be downtown Long Beach, which would probably cost a trillion dollars and would completely eliminate seagoing traffic for years. So there are very, very big implications of what's happening in the part of the world of the oceans that I think probably transcend what you guys have normally thought of, but are increasingly being realized uh, going forward. I'm going to leave the Maritime Alliance, talk about some presentations. Um, Sean, if you could pull up the one that says protecting our ocean.